Our first lesson today is from the seventh chapter of Amos. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had built, been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I am setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed and the sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. With my sword, I will rise against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all his words. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword and Israel will surely go into exile away from their native land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, get out, you seer, go back to the land of Judah, earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore at Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said, he is Elijah, and still others claimed, Jesus is a prophet like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was, but she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request. I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Once upon a time ago, my wife and I decided to take a trip to Europe. I had just graduated from the University of Arizona. Just want you to remember that back there, okay? <laughs> Went to the University of Arizona, graduated, both of us, and we decided, let's go to, worship, to Europe. And so we spent six and a half weeks wandering around Europe. 
Now, if you don't know, my degree from the U of A was in architecture. So you can imagine how much I enjoyed seeing all of these wonderful works of architecture. My wife would give me a hard time because inevitably we'd be in one of these old buildings and guess where she would find me lying on the floor, face up, looking at the ceilings and taking pictures. And you know, if you think about it, it's just awe-inspiring to think about, you know, a thousand years ago and 1500 years ago, how they could build these amazing buildings, these tall towers and high roofs, and you'd get these amazing domes. Well, have you ever thought about how in all the world they got the buildings straight? I mean, I have a hard time getting ceramic tile on the wall, you know, so it's vertical and everything is lined up correctly. How did they do this? They had no cranes. They had no lasers. They had none of the technology that we have. Well, they had a plumb bob. A plumb bob, if you don't know what it is, is the, imagine a cylinder, okay? So it's pointing on the top and round on the bottom. Tip the plumb upside down so it points downward. And then you attach a string to it and you hold it up. And because of God's amazing creation of gravity, right, it points to the center of the earth. It's perfectly plumb, straight up and down. So they would have a plumb bob way up like at the top of the dome where the dome would be. So they knew exactly where the center was. And they'd have a little marker down on the floor to make sure that that plumb didn't move around. In the beginning of the 20th century, Chicago, the birthplace of skyscrapers. How did they keep those skyscrapers straight up and down? They had a plumb at the top, usually in like the elevator shaft. So they made the building was perfectly vertical and straight and aligned. Well, today in our reading from Amos, he talks about a plumb bob. Why in all the world is a prophet in the Old Testament talking about a plumb bob? Is he building a cathedral? Is he building a skyscraper? No. He's using it as an analogy. He's sharing a vision that he has heard and seen from God. Well, how did we get here? Well, we got to go backwards, actually, further in time. You remember who the first king of Israel was? Saul, right? And the second king was King David. And then he, King David, united the 12 tribes of Israel because they were all doing their own thing. They were constantly arguing with one another. He united them together to create one kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. He died. His son becomes king. He taxes the people to death. He is corrupt. He takes away the sons to serve in his army. The people get mad. And when he dies, Solomon's son becomes king. They go to him and they beg him, please give us a relief from these taxes. Quit taking our sons. We need them, you know, like to farm the land and stuff. So we have food. And his son said, no way. He made the taxes higher, took more stuff away from the people. He oppressed them even more. And what happened? They rose up. There was a civil war. The 12 tribes divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which is called Israel. The southern kingdom, which is called Judah. And guess what we call people from the southern kingdom of Judah? We call them Jews. So 10 kingdoms to the north, two kingdoms to the south. The capital of the southern kingdom is Jerusalem. The capital of the northern kingdom, I think, is Bethel, if I remember, which is the house of God. And that's where our story in Amos takes place. Now, the king Jeroboam has a very wealthy kingdom. Life is really good. They're at peace. The people are living in absolute luxury. He talks about the fact that the people have summer homes and they have winter homes. They have silk pillows all over their homes. They deck themselves out in wonderful clothing. They have so much food to eat that they're wasting the food. The problem, of course, is not everybody 
was rich, right? A very small percentage. The people who were in power, the king, the politicians, the people who seemed to own everything, and most of the people were poor. In fact, the wealthy people would get poor people to borrow money so that they could buy food and stuff, and then the wealthy people would enslave them because of their high debt. They ignored the poor. They ignored the hungry. They were cheating one another. They'd use scales, you know, because they didn't really have money back then. You'd barter for stuff, and they'd cheat with the scales and take money away from people. It was horrible. Well, guess who got mad? God did. God was so upset with the way they were treating one another. And to make matters worse, they had been doing child sacrifices earlier. They, yeah, they'd been actually killing their kids. They had temple prostitution. Can you imagine that? They were ignoring the commandments, loving the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength and your neighbor as yourselves. They were worshiping idols, committing idolatry and adultery. Every commandment they were breaking, they ignored the covenant, the promise that God had made to them and they had made to God. God's heart was broken. So he sends prophet after prophet, and of course, they ignore him. Now, Amos happens to be from the southern kingdom of Judah. The story is taking place in the northern kingdom of Israel. And you can probably guess they didn't like each other too much. I mean, imagine the American, you know, Civil War or just prior to the Civil War. Somebody from the north going to the south and telling them that they needed to get rid of slavery. Or somebody from the south going to the north and telling them, mind your own business. We didn't get along with each other. We ended up trying to kill each other. All for the sake of freedom, right? So the people in the north are not very happy with this Amos guy showing up. Well, God gives Amos five visions. So I want you to engage your imagination a little bit and try to imagine what these visions were. The first vision that God gives to Amos is that the Israelites have had an abundant harvest. They're bringing all of the barley and the wheat in, and they can't believe the abundance that God has poured upon them. And then all of a sudden, what shows up? Locust. And in this vision, the locusts come swarming over the kingdom of Israel, consuming every piece of food in the land, and they're left starving. And Amos pleads to God, please, God, don't do this to my people. They will never survive it. And God says, okay, I will forgive them. Then he gives him a second vision. And this time he sees Israel in this fire of rain, come of, of rain, of fire? I don't know. Fire comes pouring down out of the sky. You get the point, right? Comes pouring down out of the sky and burns up and consumes the entire nation. And Amos pleads with God, please don't do this. My people will never survive. And God says, okay, I will forgive the people. Then he gives them the third vision. And that's the plumb line that we had today. And God says, what is this thing that's here? And he says, it's a plumb line. And it's measuring against a wall. And God says, the people are not measuring up. The people are crooked. They're out of kilter. They're sinful. They're hurting one another. And they won't listen to me. And if they don't listen to me, they're going to face the consequences. The wall is going to come tumbling down. I will tear everything down. Now, Amos goes and tells the king, and he goes and tells the priest. And they don't like what they hear. Well, who are you? Amos? I mean, where did you get all this learning from? You're just a, a, a farmer, and you take care of 
sycamore trees, and you're from the southern kingdom anyways. We're not really interested in what you have to say. This is just a conspiracy theory. Well, how many times have we heard that for the last five years? All right. You're, you're on the fringe. We're not interested in anything that you have to say. You don't get it, the priest says. This is the king you're talking to. This is the king who lives here in Bethel, the house of God. This is his home. Forgetting that Bethel means house of God. They kick him out. They're not interested in anything he has to say. YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, just like with Jesus last week, you know, no way. Cut him out. Nobody is allowed to even hear or listen to what he has to say. So God gives Amos a fourth vision. Now, it's summertime, and the vision is of a basket filled with fruit. Well, that sounds really yummy and sweet and wonderful, right? Here's the problem. The fruit is rotting, filled with maggots, and it's moldy, and it's gross. And God says, just like this, bowl of fruit that just gets tossed out and nobody wants it. I am tossing out Israel. I have had it. You have rejected my pleas. You have not listened to my word. And then we have the last of the visions. It's a vision of the altar and the temple, and it's being torn down and destroyed. Now, Amos was just a farmer, just a rancher. He was a shepherd. He took care of sycamore trees. He didn't consider himself a prophet or a son of a prophet. He didn't go to seminary. He didn't go to prophet's school where they told him how to preach and how to prophesy to people and tell them what was going on. And as a prophet, do you understand what a prophet does or is? See, oftentimes we think of a prophet as foreseeing what's going to happen in the future. But that's not really the primary intent of the prophet. The prophet is to proclaim God's word. Somebody doesn't choose to become a prophet. So tomorrow morning, you're not going to wake up and you say, you know, I think I'm going to retire from my job and become a prophet. It doesn't work that way. God comes to you. God says, I want you to be a prophet. And then your answer is, no, no. No, thank you, because that's what every prophet did, right? But God always gets his way. And so those person becomes a prophet. They go to the people. They declare, God loves you. You're going in the wrong direction. Your life is going to crash. Bad things are going to happen. Stop doing it. Turn back to God so he can love you and protect you and serve you and care for you. And they always say no. Almost always. That's your job. In essence, it's like carrying around a mirror, okay? The prophet shows a mirror and says, this is what you look like. This is what your actions look like. And if you're brave enough to look in the mirror, you immediately recognize all of your sins, all of your flaws, all of your errors. The fact that if you put that plumb line next to you, it's going to be straight up and down, and you're going to be kind of crooked and out of alignment. You're not going to measure up. But what happens when somebody does that to you? I mean, think about it. If somebody comes to you and tells you, you know, I'm a little concerned, you're doing this, and what do we do? We defend ourselves. We have an argument for it. We have something that we can say to contest it because we don't like people to tell us that. We like people to tell us how smart and wonderful we are. And, you know, sometimes I don't like looking in the mirror. I don't like seeing this gray hair. I don't like seeing, oh, I hate pictures from the back of me because I can see the bald spot in the back of my head, right? I see all of the wrinkles. I see all the weight that I've gained. It's the same thing. We recognize our sinfulness, our failures, and our errors. And just like the priest, just like the king, just like the people of Israel, we say, shut up. I don't want to hear it. And it's over with. That's what a prophet does. But he also tells you the consequences of your behavior, and the prophet always gives hope. So where's the good news in the midst of this? I mean, when you hear all of this stuff, because if you don't know your history, Israel falls. The Assyrian Empire comes swooping in, 
wipes out Israel. It no longer exists. By Jesus' time, it's called Samaria. The Assyrians haul the people away, and just to get really gross about it, they take giant fish, ho fish hooks on long ropes, and they hook the fish hooks into their cheeks and drag them off to slavery. Pretty gross. Life was really bad. The prophecy came true. So where's the good news in all of this? Well, I think, number one, the good news is that God cares for the poor and the needy the widow, and the orphan. He hates injustice. He wants righteousness. And remember that righteousness is about right relationship. It's not about vengeance. God wants to restore relationships between all people as well as with him. God wants us not to divide ourselves up by north and south or red or blue or black or white or whatever divisions you want to create. He wants to unite us as one in Christ, as the body of Christ. He wants to bless us, and he wants to live in the midst of us. The other thing that becomes real is when you take a look at the story of King Herod, what does that tell us? I mean, from the time of Amos to the time of Jesus, nothing had changed because leaders don't like it when people criticize them, just like we don't like criticizing one another. The world wants to be in control and not let God in control. We want to do what we want, when we want, and how we want to do it. And what happened? Jesus died because we couldn't deal with God being in control instead of us. And so the theology of the cross tells us that Christ, for our sake, died on that cross. It's this weird collision between God's desire for justice and righteousness in one side in the faith of our sinfulness and the horrible way we treat one another. They collide on the cross and Jesus dies and somehow God forgives. So that even when we're crooked and that plumb line that's held up to us shows that we're not measuring up, Christ says, I will measure up for you. Because Christ is our, our righteousness. Christ is the one who makes us stand straight and tall. Christ is the one who takes our sinfulness upon himself, gives us his righteousness. So that we receive those gifts I mentioned when we started worship this morning. Forgiveness life, and salvation. And that's the good news in the midst of the prophet Amos. Amen.